Our text is Philippians chapter 3. You can turn there in your Bibles if you would. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 20 and 21, and maybe chapter 4, verse 1, depending on how time goes exactly, we'll see. And we've been working through Philippians together, this great chapter of God's Word. Although it's been over a month since we've been in it together, we had the Christmas concerts, then we had a couple weeks off with the holidays, so we've had a break. And because of that, I want to do a little bit of review, stir up our minds by reminder, as Peter says in his second epistle, a little bit of review before we get to our new verses tonight. Philippians chapter 3, it's an extended warning and argument against false teachers, specifically the Judaizers, that is those who are uh, at least originally Jews, who said, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Jesus came and died for our sins. Jesus rose again. You must trust him to be saved. But that alone is not enough. You must also be circumcised and keep the Mosaic law if you're a Gentile. They had a lot right, but they added the law to justification. So Paul warns against them in this chapter. If you want to read more about them, you can read Acts chapter 15. See the historical time when they, when they came to be, so to speak. And also the book of Galatians, really the whole book of Galatians is against the Judaizers. But Philippians chapter 3 is a warning against them. And one thing that's clear from Acts, from Galatians, from Ephesians here, is although they have much in common with the truth, I just mentioned some of those things. Jesus is God. He's man. He died for his sins. He rose again. Faith in him is important. They had a lot in common with Paul and Peter and the true apostles. They didn't have everything in common. They had added works to grace. They had mixed works to grace, corrupting the gospel. So Paul has strong language against these teachers. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 again, if you would. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, he gives a warning. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Strong language, warning against these false teachers who add to the gospel. They're dogs. They haven't been washed from their sin. They're evil workers. They're doing a lot, but because they've corrupted the gospel of grace, they're evil. They're the false circumcision, literally the mutilation. They're no better as they go around having males circumcised as the fullness of salvation. They're no better than those who mutilate the body. You know, again, they have so much in common, though. I was doing some reading over the Christmas break, um, and some reading. I don't read unbelievers all that much, but reading some from some people, and it amazes me sometimes how much right the unbeliever can have, how many things they can get correct. The unbeliever can have a lot of things in common with the Word of God, but if they corrupt the gospel, the differences matter more. Classic illustration of having a cup of whatever you like to drink, water or coffee or tea, whatever, up here. If I had a cup of water, let's go with, and I add poison to it. Just a little bit of poison, though. Just 5% poison. That water is no longer safe. That water is no longer good. No longer water. What is it now? It's a cup of poison. If you add to the gospel of grace works, it doesn't matter the things we have in common. The differences matter more. You've corrupted the gospel. You know, we can't join today with those who corrupt the gospel. There's a constant push for that, by the way. Let's just be united Let's set aside some truth just for unity. But for believers, we must be united, even as we'll see a verse tonight, but united for the truth of the word of God and around that. So warning in verse th 2, verse 3, then he contrasts the character of the true believer. Philippians 3.3. 3. It says, we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. The true believer puts zero confidence in the flesh. They're not some confidence in the flesh and some in their works of one kind or another. Then in verse 4, really to uh, most of the rest of the chapter, Paul talks about his own personal testimony. And he does this not just so they know about it. He does it to bolster the argument against the false teachers, to show the true gospel and how it's contrary to the false gospel of the Judaizers. He talks about his own life before he knew the Lord, things he trusted in. Then as we've kind of broken it down as our study together, he talks about the three aspects or the three tenses of salvation, as we'll see again this evening. Verse 4 to 6, Paul talks about his past life, 
Talks about the things he was trusting in as a Pharisee before he met the Lord on the Damascus Road. And one of the things he says there is he says, if I can paraphrase, if anyone could get to heaven by who they were or by what they did, it would have been me. Paul says, if anyone could get there by their own righteousness, I would have been the guy. But that's not possible. So he talks about his past life, verse 4 to 6. Verse 7 and 8, he talks about the change in the spiritual accounting that happened to him. Look at verse 7 of Philippians 3, if you would. It says, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, everything I was trusting before, it went on literally the dunghill. I turned away from all those things, all those advantages, all those gains, they become a loss to me in view of the surpassing value of Christ knowing him in his salvation. Verse 9 then, he mentions in brief, a nugget form, a vacuum pack form, so to speak. He mentions justification as one of the blessings of knowing Christ. Look at verse 9. Paul says, I mean, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. We cannot earn righteousness on our own. We have no righteousness. All the righteous deeds, as Isaiah says, are like filthy garments in God's sight. But the good news, God offers his righteousness as a free gift to us because Christ paid the penalty. And he mentioned in verse 9 a couple times twice, this is by faith. It's a free gift because the penalty has been paid, the price has been paid. It's free to you and me if you will receive it through faith. Verse 9 summarizes the past tense of our salvation, justification. We're declared righteous because Christ paid our penalty. Then verse 10 to 17, Paul focuses on sanctification, as we call it sometimes, or the present tense aspect of salvation, living for the Lord in the here and now. Look at verse 10, if you would. That may be found in him in the power, um, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. Not only are we justified, but we're united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Positionally, that's true, and it works its way out practically. Look at verse 12. Paul says, not that I've already obtained it, that is perfection, or I've already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Salvation is free, 100% free, through faith, because Christ paid the penalty. But now as believers, we are to live our life with an energy, with an excitement, with a work ethic, with a diligence, pressing on to know him more and to grow in our walk with him. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, One thing I do, there's a single-minded focus for Paul, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. He cannot go to his past life of being a Pharisee. I think also implied here is he's not constantly focused on his past, uh, even the past as a Christian. He's pushing forward to know the Lord more, to grow in him. Verse 14, I press on. That's Paul, and as we'll see in a second, that's what he encourages believers to do. Press on. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 17, this is not just so the Philippians know about Paul's own walk. He's encouraging them here. Look at verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and also observe those who live like I do. In other words, not just my testimony for your interest and curiosity. Paul says, follow me. I'm pursuing the Lord. I've trusted him alone for salvation. Not a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but his righteousness through faith. Now I'm pursuing him with my, my whole heart. Paul tells the Philippians, and it's here for us too, follow me. Walk to know him more and more. Verse 18 and 19 then, he goes back to the false teachers. Because the whole context of this chapter is warning and, and guarding against the false teachers. Verse 18 For many walk, one of the reasons you need to follow me carefully 
It's because there's many out there who are teaching falsehood, living falsely. Many walk of whom I often told you, now tell you even weeping. They're enemies of the cross. Again, these are the Judaizers specifically. They talked about Christ. They talked about the cross. They said the cross was necessary. Jesus is the Savior. But the cross itself is not enough, they had said. You must also do this. In their case, keep the Mosaic law. They're enemies of the cross. Strong language, strong feeling by Paul also in verse 18. Look at verse 19. Whose end is destruction. They're going to hell. A, a mixed gospel is not a gospel at all. They're, their end is destruction. Their God is their appetites. Their glory is in their shame. They set their mind on earthly things. Their whole existence is around not heaven and where Christ is and him alone. Their whole existence is focused on the here and now. And for these legalists, these Judaizers, on everything they do, they set their mind on earthly things. Well, that gets us to verse 20. That's all review. Verse 20 and 21 are our new verses for tonight. We haven't seen in this study together. Look at verse 20. It says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of this humble state in a conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power which he has, even to subject all things to himself. And we're going to see verse, chapter 4, verse 1, 2, if we have time. He'll give the command. In light of this, stand firm. But these verses, in the summary statement, if I can say it this way, talk about glorification. The future tense of salvation. We have those three tenses, remember? Past tense, justification, declared righteous through faith in Christ, because he paid the penalty fully. Present tense, sanctification, living for the Lord with a single-mindedness of focus, I press on. Then we have the future tense of salvation, glorification, uh, when the body even is transformed. Now, an outline of these two verses, I have three points for verse 20 and 21 to keep you, uh, or at least me, on track as we go through them. We'll see three points, breaking it down. We're going to see a hev our heavenly citizenship, beginning of verse 20. Second half of verse 20, we're going to see the one we're waiting for, our heavenly Savior. And in verse 21, we'll see when he comes, he'll transform this body. We'll see our heavenly body, so to speak. So we'll see those three things in chapter 4, verse 1. Depending if we have time, we'll see. Uh, I can hedge my bets here a little bit. Chapter 4, verse 1, we're gonna, if we get to it tonight or next time, we're going to see our earthly duty in light of this. I mentioned this before, but one commentator says of Philippians chapter 3, it's a, he says, a treasure house of golden texts. I love that. Verse 20 and 21 are definitely golden texts here, rich texts. First, we're going to start with verse 20. The first thing we're going to see is our heavenly citizenship. Look at verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven. And this is a contrast with verse 19. End of verse 19 again. These false teachers, they set their mind on earthly things. In contrast to them, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, this would have been a ready illustration for the Philippians. Philippi was a Roman colony. You know, not all the citizens, not all the, not all the people in the Roman Empire were citizens. Uh, many, many weren't, kind of unlike the uh, United States today. But many people in the Roman Empire weren't Roman citizens. But the city of Philippi was a Roman colony. The residents of Philippi, they were citizens of Rome, the capital city. Well, in a similar way, in a greater degree, the believers at Philippi, their true and most important citizenship is in heaven. I love what one commentator said about this verse, this idea. He says, their names are inscribed on heaven's register. Their lives are being governed from heaven in accord with heavenly standards. Their rights are secured in heaven. Their interests are being promoted there. To heaven their thoughts and prayers ascend and their hopes arise. For the believers at Philippi, for every believer, for you and me today, our citizenship is in heaven. You know, we sing about our names are written down in glory. That's true of the true believer. Now note verse 20 again. Our citizenship is, present tense, is in heaven. This is a present tense idea for the believer. Not only are we going to heaven in the future, it's not uh, 
my citizenship will be there someday, but today, believer, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, as we study this tonight, believer, our citizenship right now is in heaven. Our names are written down in glory. Christ tells the 70 when they come back in Luke chapter 10, the 70 who he sent out, they come back rejoicing that even the demons are subject to them. You know what Christ tells them? Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. That's true of every believer. Our names are written down in heaven. We are citizens of the new Jerusalem to come. It's a wonderful truth, right? Uh, It's so simply and clearly stated But the wonder of it should thrill the heart of the believer. And it should not only thrill us, but impact every part of our lives. Turn back to chapter 1 of Philippians, if you would. Chapter 1, verse 27. Paul's already talked about this back in chapter 1, verse 27. It says, that verse says, Only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. That word conduct we have in English, it comes from the word to live as a citizen of. It's in the same family group as our citizenship is in heaven. Again, chapter 1, verse 27, conduct yourself. The idea is live as a citizen of your true country. Later on in the book, he says your true citizenship, your most important citizenship at least, is in heaven. That's to impact our lives today. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Live as a citizen of heaven. What's that look like? Verse 27, He talks about, so whether I come to you and see you or remain absent, I will hear you are standing firm. That's what it's going to mean to live as a citizen of heaven on earth. Stand firm. That's what chapter 4 is going to say again if we get there. Standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Living as a citizen of heaven involves standing firm from the persecutions that come, from the false teaching that comes. And it means uh, unity for believers striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, it's not a unity with the Judaizers or anyone who corrupts the word of God and the gospel of grace, but it is a unity amongst true believers striving together to live in light of that faith and to promote the gospel. Maybe I'll say here, we do have a dual citizenship, right? Ultimately, and most importantly, we are citizens of heaven. But Paul was a Roman citizen. He used that to his advantage. At Philippi is one of the places. Um, although I wonder why. Side track, but he gets beaten up and thrown in prison at Philippi. Then the next day, he tells him, I'm a Roman citizen. And like, oh, we're sorry. I would have told him that the night before. Maybe stop the beating, but we'll ask Paul that maybe in the future. We have it, uh, and we, most of us, uh, are citizens here, and maybe you have even a dual citizenship on earth. We have earthly responsibilities to our earthly countries. We want to be good citizens as far as we can be, living according to the laws of the land, whether we're a citizen of this country, as we are, most of us at least, or even if we're in a country, a different country, we have a citizenship there. We can take advantage of that in a proper way, but that's not our main focus. Our main and our eternal citizenship is in heaven. Go to Colossians, if you would, just right after Philippians Colossians chapter 3. Again, this truth of our position, our citizenship in heaven, is to control us today. Control our joy, our excitement, and our lives. Colossians chapter 3, pick up in verse 1. Therefore, if we've been raised up with Christ, the believer has been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. That's where your focus needs to be. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on earth. Can we have earthly responsibilities? We serve the Lord with vigor today, but it's not all about the here and now. It's about heaven and heaven's rewards in the future. Verse 3, if you've died with Christ and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In different terminology than our citizenship is in heaven, but kind of a similar idea, right? Our life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. We have a present heavenly citizenship, but it hasn't been manifest to the world yet. That will be manifest in the future when we come again with Christ. Back to Philippians chapter 3, if you would. Again, this truth is control all of our thinking. Christ tells us, Matthew chapter 6, as we have it, do not store up treasure on earth. 
Those things are temporary. Those things can be taken away. Store it for yourself, treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Thieves cannot break in and steal. It's control our whole lives. Our citizenship, our reward is in heaven, believer. So verse 20, first part of verse 20, we have our heavenly citizenship. It's in heaven. Now look at verse 20 again. From which we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's our heavenly savior as I've titled it. Our citizenship's there. And we're waiting with an anticipation for Christ to return. Let's take this short phrase in reverse order. So small, I think we can do that without getting confused. We're waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Christ, the Messiah. Um, Same word as, it's the Messiah in the Old Testament, Christ in the New Testament. He's the promised one. He's the promised king. Come to die once, come again to reign. He is the Christ, the king, the anointed one, the promised one. He is, verse 20, He is Jesus. That's his human name. Yahweh saves. He is Jesus. The Lord. He is God. We saw that this morning in John chapter 1. Distinct from God the Father, but God himself as well. And he is the master of the believer. He is Lord and he is Savior. We wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the city of Ephesus in 48 B.C., The Ephesians gave the title Universal Savior of Mankind to Julius Caesar. And Caesar, as they even as they changed, was known as that through the Roman Empire. The universal savior of mankind. You know, I won't say anything. That's not true though, right? There's one savior. It's not Caesar. It's not any human government, human leader. It's not any political situation. It, It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the savior He's a savior from the penalty of sin for those who trust in him because he paid it all. He saves from the penalty of sin. He saves from the power of sin, even for the believer today, because the believer has been united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And specifically in this verse, I think the focus is on the future. He's the savior to come. He saves from the wrath of God. He saves even the believer in the church from the tribulation judgments to come. He is the savior. And again, the only Savior, the Bible emphasizes this a number of times, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 20, we eagerly wait for him. It's like it's a, a eager expectation for him, a tippy-toe expectation, so to speak, longing for him from heaven, like a child waiting for his parent to come home, or the ice cream truck, whichever one's more exciting for the kid. Excited about it. As a bride waiting for the groom. There's a, our picture's reversed, but there's an excitement for his coming. Now he's coming. la di da No, it's an eager expectation waiting for him from heaven. Go back to John chapter 14, if you would. And these truths, which are so marvelous, are so clearly and simply stated. John chapter 14. You know, you need the Holy Spirit to really understand and appreciate the truth of the Word of God because we're blind apart from salvation, apart from His work. But the Bible is not a book you need a doctorate to understand. It's written for us to understand. John chapter 14, I love how clearly it, clear it is. How clearly it is. It's clearer than that. John 14, verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. He's going to tell them about his return. This should give comfort to the believer. Do not let your heart be troubled. In the world, we have many tribulations. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If we're not terrible, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. He says this to his disciples. um, Oh, 12 hours or so, maybe, before he's crucified. But in his crucifixion, he's going to prepare a place by dying for them, and then he'll prepare the place. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Christ promises, I'm going to prepare a place. And he promises, if I go prepare a place, I will return and receive you to myself. What a promise. And we will be with him forever. 
How encouraging. Now, Philippians is focusing on, this verse too, I believe, focusing on the rapture of the church. When Christ comes for his bride, the church takes us into his, his presence as verse 21 makes explicit. This is when the believer's body is transformed. But when is this going to happen? When is Christ going to come again? Well, from clock time, if I can call it that, from calendar time, from whatever time it is now, whatever date it is now, no idea. We don't know when Christ is coming again. He tarries because he's patient, saving more sinners like you and like me. From the clock, we don't know. But from the prophetic timeline, we know he's coming before the tribulation. And he's coming imminently. That is, at any moment, he could come back for, him, for us. This truth, we should be eagerly anticipating. We should be living in light of. You know, as time goes by, if we're not careful, we can start to think, you know what, he hasn't come so far. You know what, in almost 2,000 years of church history, almost X amount of time since I've been a believer. If he hasn't come, if he hasn't come yet, you know, maybe, maybe he won't. Well, yes, maybe he won't. But maybe he will. Maybe he'll come before yet we're done with this. He is coming again. Uh, you know, our excitement, sometimes it starts off as a new believer, an excitement, can't wait for the Lord to return, and then, you know, well, I have this to do in life, this to do in life. It'd be nice to do this. Our anticipation for him should build. Romans tells us that the day of our salvation is now nearer than when we first believed. I like what one writer said, John Phillips says, every night we pitch our tent a day's march nearer home. Christ is coming again, and we get closer and closer to that time. Go to 1 Peter, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 1. Exciting truth, right? Believer, thrilling truth. You know, but everything in this world... The world system ruled by the devil, the ruler himself, the devil, and even our flesh fights in wars to get our attention on the here and on the now. If we're not careful, even as believers, we can start to be consumed with this world instead of the heaven to come. So 1 Peter chapter 1, I just want to note verse 13 together. It says, therefore, and he talks about the great inheritance that we have earlier in chapter 1. It's undefiled will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And we're protected. It's guaranteed. But in verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on their grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's actually only one main command in verse 13. Fix your hope. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. Have your attention there. The first two ones are... Uh, participles that support it. Things we need to be doing if we're going to keep our hope fixed there. It says, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit. If we're not working in our minds, redeemed by the Holy Spirit, if we're not keeping sober, keeping our attention is going to get off the coming of Christ as it shouldn't. It's going to take mental discipline, spiritual discipline, not willpower and our own strength, but strength by the Holy Spirit to keep our attention there. Everything's trying to pull you to focus on the here. Even as believers. Believer, verse 13, prepare your minds for action. Gird up the loins of your mind, literally. Keep sober. Fix your hope at the coming of Christ. Go back to Philippians chapter 3, if you would. Back to Philippians chapter 3. So we have a heavenly Savior who is coming, and that's where should be our, our focus should be there. He's coming. It could be today. I do like what... Uh, same commentator I read earlier says about this section. I thought it was a good point. Let me read what he says about the end of verse 20. Though the glories of the intermediate state are not absent from the mind of the apostle, the intermediate state being when we die, our spirit will be go, go to be with Christ. He talks about this even in the same book, Philippians chapter 1. And Paul says individually for the believer, for him, it's very much better. Um, in there's a preference there. But it's not the ultimate thing. So this writer says, though the glories of the intermediate state are not absent from the mind of the apostle, nevertheless, he does not fall into the air into which we are so prone to become enslaved, ensnared. Namely, that, the, uh, that of emphasizing the intermediate state at the expense of the Lord's advent. Philippians chapter 1, other passages talk about the intermediate state. 
But Paul is most excited for the rapture, the return of the Lord. Yes, if he dies before that, that's personally advantageous for him. Uh, it's very much better, as he says, but it's not the main focus. The main focus of the believer shouldn't it be, I can't wait to die and go to heaven. The main excitement, the eager anticipation of the believer is, I'm longing for the Lord. He is coming again, maybe today. Now, we may wait, yes. We patiently endure that, but he may come today. Back in Philippians chapter 3, we see our heavenly Savior. We have a heavenly citizenship. It's in heaven even today. We wait for the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. In verse 21, then, he talks about one thing the Savior will do when he returns. As we read, he'll change and glorify this body. So we have the heavenly body, so to speak. Again, look at verse 21. When he comes, he will transform the body of this humble state in a conformity with the body of his glory. He'll glorify us, change our bodies. Now, this present body is called the body of this humble state. The old King James has this vile body, which um, not the right idea in modern day vernacular, at least. The body isn't vile in the way we think of it today. It's not evil. That's a pagan thought. God created all things good. The physical universe, the human, even the human body. Now, the body can be used in vile things in sin, but the body itself isn't the prison house of the soul, as pagan philosophers taught. The body is good in its original creation. So that, that gives the wrong idea in modern English, at least. The idea is this lowly body, as we have it, as I'm reading from the New American Standard, at least. This low body, this humble body, the body of this humble state. Uh, you know, on one hand, this body is amazing. You know, life is amazing. As you study the wonder of creation, the wonder of the human body and human life, it's amazing. You know, you read, you can read details about all the different molecules and cells and it's been forever since biology, so I won't try to go into details there. But, you know, all the different uh, organization, Psalm, 19, um, Psalm 139 says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. On the one hand, this body is amazing, God's handiwork. But on the other hand, in verse 21, it says this lowly body. Now, this body is lowly, it's humble. In comparison to other beings, a bear, physical strength-wise. Now, we're much smarter, I hope we are, um, some of us. But, you know, don't fight a grizzly bear without your weapons. Angels, Michael, Gabriel, other angels, we're much weaker physically than them. So it's a lowly body in that regard. But I think probably the focus here is you know, we live under the curse. And our bodies, they're on the downhill slide. Um, and this is evident in many ways. I was never a uh, world-class class athlete or a state class or city class. But I used to be able to jump off the ground. Now if I get off the ground, it's an accomplishment if I don't get hurt doing it. Or I look in the mirror, and I'm either middle-aged or approaching middle-aged, depending on your age, how you, whether you think, I mean, if you're young, you think I'm middle-aged. If you're old, you think he's still young. But then I see a picture of me on my office of Laura and I getting married almost 13 years ago, and huh, that's not the same man. It's a, the body goes down, right? And very quickly. It hasn't been that long in the scheme of things, and all these spots on my face, and I don't need to talk too much about me. <laughs> if you want to see the lowliness of the body, someone's making fun of me. <laughs> I want to see hum one humorous section on the deterioration and the lowliness of the body. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, right? Uh, sees the deterioration of the body. Humorous passage there. Um, not only does it deteriorate in the you know, long, slow death, so to speak, but also sometimes major injuries or diseases happen, and the body you can't walk for a while or... Something happens and kills someone even in the prime of their life. This body is a lowly body. We live under the curse. Of course, in the end, this body dies and decays. You know, the Egyptians mummified it um, in their idea of the afterlife, which was mistaken. But the body, it returns to dust. Made from dust and under the curse, it returns to dust. This is the lowly body. But verse 21 he will transform the body of this humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. He'll transform this body. And specifically, he'll transform it into the same type of body that he presently has. Christ in his resurrection is a prototype 
of the new humanity, the resurrection to glory. You know, sometimes companies release a prototype of this vehicle or that vehicle, you know, and they haven't had the full um, factory spin up and all the cars aren't coming off the line yet, but they have the prototype. Well, in a similar way, Christ is the prototype of the body the believer will have in the future. In the conformity, verse 21, the body of his glory. He died for our sins. He didn't stay dead, right? He rose from the grave, never to die again. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we don't know that much about the glorified body we will receive. Uh, but we know some things. I just want to think a little bit through the word of God. But some of the things we know about the glorified body that we'll, we will have. It will be like his body. And we'll see some other things too. 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. Paul starts out this chapter by reminding the Corinthians of the gospel in verse 3. He says, I delivered you as first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, paid the penalty by his death on the cross. He was buried and he was raised. And that's going to be the focus in of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection of believers. And he goes on to say even, if you say that there's no resurrection of the dead, that means that Christ hasn't been raised. If Christ hasn't been raised, Christianity is stupid. Of all men, believers are most to be pitied. But Christ did rise from the grave, guaranteeing our future. Jump down, if you would, to verse 35. Some will say, how are the dead raised? And this is an idea that's mocked by the world, by pagan philosophers. Paul, Acts 17, he's laughed off the stage, so to speak, when he brings up the resurrection of the dead at Athens. Maybe the influencing of the world and creeping in at Corinth here, it seems to be. How are the dead raised? What kind of body are they going to have? I mean, that's not going to work to live forever in this lowly body that can be sick and weak and decaying. That's what kind of body? It's not a question of interest. It's a question of that's impossible. Verse 36, you fool. It says for the believer, it's a foolish thing to not believe what God has said about the resurrection of the dead. He goes on to explain if I can summarize, the glory of the resurrection body, it's greater than this glory, the glory of this body. Jump down, though, to verse 42. Also in the resurrection of the dead, this body is sown perishable. This body can die. It's raised, and we have a contrast here between this present body and the glorified body of the believer to come. It's sown perishable. It's raised imperishable. Cannot die. It's sown in dishonor. That's this present body. It's raised in glory, sown in weakness. We mentioned some of the weaknesses. Raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Now, don't be confused. It's not saying it's spiritual in the sense it's not physical, tangible. Um, the idea here, this natural body, the body we have now is empowered by um, the soul, gives it life. And that resurrection body, the Holy Spirit will bring it to life and empower it, I take it. So it's spiritual body in that sense. Not in, not, not in that it's not tangible and physical. And he goes on to say, first, where we have the same type of body as Adam had, this lowly body. But we will have a type of body like Christ has. He's the prototype, as you can read the verses for yourselves. Our body to come, it is imperishable, glory, powerful, spiritual body. It will be a body like the body, a resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we know about that? A couple of things. Same body went in the grave, came out of the grave. You know, same one that was buried came forth. Same body for him, same person. Um, it's physical and tangible, right? Christ could eat. He says, give me some fish to eat. And he ate with him at times. Thomas, he says, come. Touch my hands, feel my side. Physical, tangible. Now, side note, I don't think Christ having the wounds visible means, you know, if you're hurt or maimed in this life, too bad. Um, I think those are special for him. We have a body. You know, I had some teeth knocked out in high school. I think it'll be a new tooth. I don't think it'll be this old one. Anyways, I think that's special. But physical, tangible. Christ's body had a glory. The limits of this present body seem to be not there. You know, one time he appears in a room Without the door having been opened, you know, time, uh, space didn't 
confine him at least. It seems maybe we'll be able to do that as well. You know, we don't know exactly what the body will be like, but it'll be a body of glory, the same type of body that Christ had in his resurrection. You know, exactly what it will be like, it'll be great. <laughs> you know, these hands, these feet, just, what will it be like exactly? Well, exactly we'll wait and see. Turn to First John, if you would. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. In verse 1 of 1 John 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us. Presently, the believer is the child of God. Our citizenship, different picture, um, different truth, but overlap here. We are presently a child of God. Our citizenship is presently in heaven. Our life is presently hidden with Christ on high. We are children of God. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. The fullness of what we will be when Christ comes again in glorification hasn't been fully revealed. Now bits and pieces, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, we're reading and uh, studying in Philippians 3, but the fullness of it hasn't been revealed. We know when he appears, so we're reading about in Philippians, when he comes back, when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And when he returns, even if it's tonight, we'll meet him face to face. The one that now we only know by faith, we will see him. And in that seeing, we'll be made like him. This is externally, physically. We'll be made like him, not that we'll look exactly the same, but same type of body though. Externally, the body will be transformed, but also internally, not the main focus of Philippians, but I'll mention it here. Internally, we'll be made perfect too, right? That's gonna be, I mean, now we are justified, we are pursuing the Lord, but we are not made perfect yet. We still, as James says, stumble. We still battle us, and that battle will be removed too. That alone makes us long for glory, right? When sin's removed, even the battle of sin's removed, and this will happen at glorification when the body is transformed as well. Go back to Philippians chapter three. He will transform this body. Oh, we have to just, let me just mention these things. We won't go to the passages. Philippians focusing on the transformation of the body. Um, we're gonna do things for eternity, right? God doesn't raise us to resurrection life, transformation life, glorification. You know, there's a far side. Maybe you've seen it or heard about it before. A man, you know, an angel, so to speak, a man sitting on a cloud, halo on his head, wings, and he's sitting on a cloud all by himself, looks bored, and then the caption reads, I wish I had brought a magazine. Oh, you know, this is boring. That's not what God raises us to life for. I have Revelation 21 and 22 in my notes. We some, see some of what we will do, some of what we'll be missing in our ultimate destiny, some of what we will have. We will have intimate fellowship with the Lord. We will serve him. We will see his face. We will exist forever, resurrected, glorified, to reign with him, to serve him, to know him forever and ever. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And while we do have the joy of the Lord today, the fullness of it yet is to come at glorification. But back in Philippians chapter three, a couple of things, getting ahead of myself, sorry, bear with me. Uh, I don't know if the kids still use it or not, but... FOMO, it's an acronym, fear of missing out, you know, and they talk about this, especially with social media, people have a fear of missing out, their friend's going to do, you know, you know, believe it, we don't need to have a fear of missing anything, whether we, no matter what our earthly lot is, and they're different even for believers, not going to miss out on anything, you don't have the vacation you want, you don't have the house that someone else has, you don't have the job that fulfills every need, you don't, you know what? That's God's race for you, and you're lacking nothing. You will have glory to come, resurrected with the Lord in his presence, serving him, ruling with him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So set your mind above, on heaven, not on earth. Also with this body, Philippians, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 tells us that physical discipline has little profit. 
but spiritual discipline has profit for this life and for eternity. I think it's wise to take care of this earthly body, um, do things for it, you know, not close my eyes and walk through traffic and try to get killed. Uh, There's some wisdom there. There's a little profit. But the main focus isn't on this body, trying to maintain this body or beautify this body in every way possible. Don't be obsessed with it. Be wise. Your body belongs to the Lord. Use it properly. Be wise with it. But that's not where our focus or our worry lies. Christ says, do not fear you. If they kill the body, fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So the focus isn't on this body and the here and now. That's, again, everything in this world, uh, the medias of all different kind, and not just that, but the world system, focus here, believer. Make sure this life's going to be easy. Uh, you know, what, what if you don't have this? What if you don't have that? Well, I'll enjoy God's good blessings. I'll be wise if I can with this body. I'd rather not be sick. If I have the option, be sick or not be sick. I'll not be sick. But that's not where the focus lies. Our focus lies in the future. Back in Philippians chapter, yes, we're ready now. Back in Philippians chapter three, verse 21. The one who's gonna do this in verse 21 is the Lord Jesus Christ. End of verse 20, we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform It is the Lord Jesus Christ specifically who will raise this body. Just listen to John chapter 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming which all who are in the tombs will hear my voice, will come forth. And there'll be two general categories of resurrection. Resurrection of the righteous, believers, and resurrection of the wicked. But all who are in the graves, from Adam down to the last person who dies, will hear the voice of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, and will come forth. And we did this with Lazarus. He didn't raise Lazarus to resurrection, glorified life. But after Lazarus has been dead four days, don't open the tomb. It's going to be stinky. Decay has set in. What's he say? Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus gets up and obeys. There's coming a day in which he will say the words and will raise men from the dead. Believers at the rapture of the church. This might be what the shout of 1 Thessalonians 4 is about. That passage on the rapture, there's three accompanying sounds with the rapture. A shout could be the the shout of command of the Lord Jesus Christ calling uh, believers from the dead and calling us to be with himself, but don't know exactly. But he will do it. How will he do it? You say, this is impossible. Again, the world mocks Acts 17 and then people today, people freeze their bodies. Side note, got them. People, some people freeze their bodies because they think, you know, if I can just preserve this physical body, um, cryostasis, you know, maybe science will be able to raise it back to life. You know, most people say, resurrection, that's impossible. How's that going to happen? You know, the body dies, it decays. You know, you think of the situation maybe. Someone, a believer being buried at sea, you know, he's eaten by the fishies, and then someone catches the fish, eats the fish. You know, so, I, you know, that carbon molecule or whatever it is, you know, protein, was in man, now it's in fish, now it's in this. Is it going to go to Dwayne or this other person? That's that's not going to work. Verse 21, he will do this by the exertion of the power which he has even to subject all things to himself. How's it going to happen? The power of God. Impossible. Resurrection. This is pie in the sky. Myths. Wishful thinking. This is the promise of God by the power of God. He will say the word, and by his power, the exertion of his power, the energy of his power, he'll bring the dead to life. He made all things by his word. The farthest galaxy we've never seen, uh, the smallest particles that we still discover more and more. He spoke, it came into being. Specifically through the Son, as John 1 tells us, all things came into being through him. He is the Almighty the Almighty. Nothing's too difficult for him. He rose Lazarus. Again, that's not resurrection life. He is raised from the dead. He can do it by his power. In note verse 21, he can subject and he will subject all things to himself. The power he has that will raise us from the dead, it's a power that will not only raise us, but subject everything to himself. And in the end, Christ wins, right? Christ rules. He will defeat every, every enemy, the last enemy being death. He will put all things under his feet. That's how powerful he is. He's able to raise you, believer. So don't doubt. Don't be discouraged. Wonder. Say, wow. But don't doubt. 
He has promised. He will do it. Verse four, chapter four, verse one, let me mention, and we'll pick it up then next time. Uh, you know, our chapter breaks and verse breaks were added later with the invention of the printing press, and they started to become more common. I don't think chapter, the best, it's the best chapter break here with chapter four, because chapter four starts with the word therefore, and gives the application of what he's been talking about. Let me just mention it. We'll pick it up next time. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. He says, in light of what I've just talked about, your heavenly citizenship, waiting for the Savior, waiting for that resurrected body, because of this, therefore, the command then, one command, end of the verse, stand firm. Heaven is secure. He will come. Plant your feet like a soldier in a battle, and it is a battle, and stand firm. Persecution comes, stand firm. False teachers, and those he's warning against in Philippians 3, they don't seem to be amongst them yet, but they will come. People try to corrupt the word of God, corrupt the gospel of grace, say, no, my feet are planted on the word of God alone. And you know what? Do what you may. My hope is secure. Heaven is sure. So stand firm in the Lord. You know, every major passage on the future, on the resurrection, on the rapture at least, has a application connected with it. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we don't need to be worried about the future, about details especially, about the resurrection, the rapture. You know, why does that matter? Well, it matters because God has said it. It matters because that's our hope. And it matters because that's one of the things God uses to help us plant our feet in this case. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, the rapture is a comforting doctrine. We grieve, but not of those who don't have hope. 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter on the resurrection of the dead ends with, therefore, be steadfast, stand firm, same idea, be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. Because our work is not in vain. It might feel like we're going through our toil, our day-to-day toil at work, at home, our ministries together. It might feel like this is, you know, just spinning my wheels, getting up and doing it again. It's not. If we're doing it for the Lord, the reward will come. You know, right after the resurrection at the rapture, you know what happens? The Bema Seat of Christ, which is a fearful and an exciting thing for the believer. We'll stand before him to receive a reward and loss of reward. So bound in your labor for the Lord. Stand firm. Pri- pressures come. Trials come. False teaching comes. We'll pick this up more next week. But stand firm in the Lord. Such amazing verses. Such marvelous truths. Again, such simply and clearly stated. Amazing truth, but just stated matter of fact, black and white. So we would know them, grab hold of them. And set our mind firmly on those things. Again, let me say, believer, everything in this world is trying to get your focus off the return of Christ. He's probably going to tarry. He might in his patience. But are you ready? If he doesn't tarry, you're going to say, oh, I wasn't living godly. I wasn't serving you with energy. I wasn't, you know, I thought you were going to wait. I thought I had time. There will come a generation, maybe it's us, that the trumpet will sound, the voice will go, and he will return. So be fixing your hope there. Don't let the world fill your mind with the word of God. That's why the word of God is so vital for us. It fixes our attention on him and on our hope. Don't be consumed by the world, the world's entertainments, the world's pleasures. Don't be overwhelmed by the world's pains. Fix your hope completely there. That's where our hope is. Let me just end by saying, we have a glorious hope as believers, right? Amen. We, we long for the return of Christ. There is coming a resurrection of the lost. It's not a resurrection to glory, though. It's a resurrection to doom. Every person will hear the voice of Christ and come forth from their tomb, their burial place. Some are the resurrection of life. I trust that's you. Some are the resurrection of death and eternal hell. Well, which group? How do you go to this group? How do you not go to that group? It all comes down to simple trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in him. Back in chapter three, verse nine, we don't have a righteousness of our own. We can't put enough good works on the, bat, on the one side and outweigh our sin. The penalty for sin is death. But Christ paid the penalty. The penalty for sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So you know, if you don't know where you are or you know you're on the resurre- path of resurrection of judgment, there's a free gift offered to you. If you trust in the Savior, he'll give you eternal life, forgiveness, his protection, his love in this life, and glory to come. So make sure you've trusted him. And then believer, set your hope completely on the grace be brought to you at the return of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, do thank you for your word. Thank you for this great chapter in Philippians. Lord, precious, infinite treasure of truth. Lord, may the truth control our hearts and minds again. Lord, as we look at the end of the chapter and the glories that we have to come, Lord, this world we know, it's trying to pull our attention down. And even we admit, Lord, it does at times. Lord, but help us to look at your word again, to see what you've promised about our future. Lord, and to set our hope there as we live properly now. Lord, even now you say our citizenship is in heaven. Lord, help us to live as citizens of heaven, standing firm, striving together for the faith of the gospel, living holy as your children. Lord, may we not blend in with the world around us in a wrong way. May not be conformed to the lusts of this world. May we conform to heaven and your standards. Thank you for this great truth. Help us to live in light of it. Help us to praise you as we live in light of it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.